Two big stories tonight. President Biden's massive remake of the American social safety net hangs by a thread right now. And breaking news out of Florida, where police found body parts in their search for Gabby Petito's killer. Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. We're going to head to D.C. in just a couple of minutes. But first, to Florida. Police searching for Gabby Petito's boyfriend found what they describe as partial human remains. This is helicopter footage of the Carlton Preserve Swamp. Brian Laundrie's parents said he went hiking there as the dragnet closed in. Searchers found his girlfriend in Wyoming murdered shortly after Laundrie arrived back in Florida from a trip without her. We have former FBI Assistant Director Danny Clawson tell us exactly what the FBI's tight-lipped statement really means. We start with News Nation's Brian Enden, who has covered this story since people hoped they would find Gabby alive. Brian, good evening. Good evening, Leland. Yes, it is a tight lip statement that we got from the FBI today. They didn't take any questions, but this is the latest in what they told us. They have come across human remains here at the Carlton Reserve behind me, the same reserve they've been searching for close to five weeks. They won't say whether or not at this point those human remains are Brian Laundry, but they say near the remains they also uh, located items that belong to Brian Laundry, including a notebook. Uh, and a backpack. Listen to what the FBI told us earlier. Investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundry. These items were found in an area that up until recently have been underwater. So up until recently, uh, this area has been flooded. Even this road that you see behind me was about a foot underwater up until just about a week and a half ago because there's been so much uh, rain in Florida. The FBI says once those floodwaters receded, uh, they were able to locate these remains and personal items. Leland. Brian, we're looking at video of Brian Laundrie's parents who have played this very odd role here. It was, I think, a couple of days ago that the police basically called no joy and left the reserve and allowed the public to go back in. Then last night, the laundry say they want to go look for their son. And shockingly, they find things and then the police find the body. It seems just to add more questions than answers, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's certainly a very, very strange set of circumstances. And I actually just got off the phone with the Laundry's family attorney, Stephen Bertolino, and rushed over here uh, for this live shot. And what he told me was that uh, the Laundry's realized that the reserve was back open to the public, that they wanted to search for their son because they had an idea of the hiking trails that he liked to go out on, and so that they alerted Northport Police and the FBI Two police officers met up with them this morning. Uh, Chris and Roberta Laundry and the two officers went out, and then they all together discovered uh, the personal items and then the human remains. So very clearly, there were officers with the parents when they discovered this, answering one part of the question. Do we have any reason to believe that the body parts that were found were not those of Brian Laundry? We have no reason to believe that. Um, we don't know, obviously. Uh, we know that the body parts, the remains, were uh, submerged underwater for quite some time. So the condition uh, of the remains might not be good. We're not sure how long it'll take to positively uh, identify them. But yes, you picked up on it. It's interesting. We just confirmed, really, for the first time, according to the attorney, that it was the parents with the police uh, when this discovery was made. Got it. All right. Hey, Brian, thank you very much. Incredible reporting. Obviously, we'll come back to you. Uh, sunset there, but we'll come back to you if there's any more information out of Florida. Thank you. So we know that the FBI found what appears to be those human remains and the two personal items belonging to Brian Laundry: a book bag and a notepad. We don't know if it's him, if so, how he died or the like. For that, we bring in Danny Colson, former deputy assistant director for the FBI. Uh, all right, Danny, you, you know, after 40 years in the Bureau, you develop a nose for these kinds of things. You heard <laughs> what the special agent in charge in Tampa said in that statement. Decode it for us. Well, I think what he's saying is that uh, it's him. 
Uh, the FBI is very conservative about making public announcements, as, as you know. And I think he's just um, he's covering his bases here, and he's gonna it's gonna wait till DNA is done. Uh, the FBI didn't want to say it's him, and they look like a fool later when they find it's not him. But uh, it's him. I, I, there's no way it's not him. And right. I think the strange thing about it is the parents go out and find it. That that raises a lot of questions for me, and I don't want to to cast any disparagement uh, upon anybody, but. Uh, this, this, this is really an issue. It's a strange situation, and, and we just let it let this thing play out a little bit. Yeah, Brian brought that up and sort of talked about this, how the reserve was back open, the swamp was back open. The parents say, oh, gee, we want to go out and look for our son, and lo and behold, they happen to find him after weeks of the FBI and others searching and not finding him. You zeroed in on whether or not the parents were involved. Very importantly, there's no reason to believe uh, they are suspects. They haven't been named suspects in, in any way, but uh, clearly they told police that they let their son go to this area. Here is Gabby Petito's sister talking about Laundry's parents. Take a listen. I worry about him. I hope he's okay. And then I'm angry and I don't know what to think. I would tell my brother to just come forward and get us out of this horrible mess. I don't know if my parents are involved. I think if they are, then they should come glean. Brian Petito's sister talking about her parents. Got for, for your own daughter to say, I don't know if my parents were involved, in a way that seems like quite an admission. It's almost an indictment. I mean, um, and, and if you think about your children um, and how they understand your body language and, and, and the context of how they have relationships with your siblings, um, it's, just, it's, it's just strange. And I, I don't want to jump to any conclusions here, and we should not do that. That would be inappropriate. But there are a lot of questions that need to be answered here. And um, I hope the FBI gets to the bottom of it. I, I hope these people aren't involved. But that's bizarre. That after all these searches, that they would go out. And, oh, here he is. Um, that's that's like a TV script, and it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, there's a lot of things that don't make sense, which is why we have you on to talk about them. Uh, Danny, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, as always, for the time and the expertise. As you point out, the story's uh, far from over. Almost more questions than answers than we had yesterday. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Leland, it's always good to see you. All right, we head to Washington now, where the latest developments pit Democrat against Democrat in a way we've almost never seen before. And while that might not sound too exciting, their differences could block virtually all of President Biden's campaign promises. We are talking about free childcare, child tax credits, free community college, Medicare expansion, a massive tax increase to pay for it all. There's tree equity in there as well uh, in this spending bill, the wish list, if you will. While that plays out, there's a sideshow drama over who will be the next ambassador to Japan. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually serves as a proxy for the many differences inside the Democratic Party right now. The Senate is holding confirmation hearings for White House Chief of Staff under Barack Obama, Rahm Emanuel. He also served as the mayor of Chicago, good friend of the Clintons. By normal political standards, he should be a shoe-in, served closely with Bill and Hillary Clinton, an enforcer for Democratic leadership in Congress, former White House Chief of Staff. The list goes on and on but he faces protests from a number of progressive lawmakers. That is Democrats protesting Democrats. These are some of the lawmakers who have spoken out against Rahm. They're upset over the way he handled the shooting death of Laquan McDonald during his time as Chicago mayor. Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri called the Senate on, out on Twitter today for holding Rahm Emanuel's confirmation hearing on the same day of McDonald's death seven years ago. In the Senate hearings, the senators pressed Emanuel on whether or not he was part of that cover-up. There's negotiation to get their own agenda items into that spending bill. Congressman, we're honored to have you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Rahm Emanuel's a legend in the Democratic Party by sort of every sense of the word. Does he not deserve the benefit of the doubt? You know, we always talk about the benefit of, of the doubt when it comes to someone losing their lives, particularly black people losing their lives. Um, he does not deserve the benefit of the doubt. We have to, you know, really ask ourselves, who do we want to represent our country? An ambassadorship is a very prestigious position. Is someone who represents America to other nations. 
And should we allow someone uh, to represent us who was a part of uh, the mishandling, gross mishandling, and covering up of another black person uh, being killed uh, in our country? You know, and whether whether it's Trayvon Martin or Eric Gardner or Tamir Rice or Laquan McDonald or Breonna Taylor, the list goes on yeah, and, but on, Congressman, and on. Congressman, I think it's it's fair to say those are those are different cases. What happened to Laquan McDonald? Everyone agrees was awful, and there's a reason people are in jail because of it. Uh, what's interesting about this is it's one of the rare things that has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. Here's a Republican coming out in favor of. Rahm Emanuel, take a listen. Does U.S. foreign policy the need to have someone who has the respect of the Japanese, which Rahm Emanuel does, uh, perhaps overshadow that he could have handled something better as mayor? There are hundreds of people who have quality relationships and understanding of what's happening with Japan, Taiwan, and China that could be considered for this position other than Rahm Emanuel. So, Again, you, so you think? So, so let me ask you this: Do you think this is just sort of a political patronage, a payoff by the Biden administration? Listen, listen. There are too many people who have been a part of the Democratic Party who have gotten cushy jobs and have been promoted and have failed up in the party for far too long. And the party needs to do better. The party needs to hold itself to a higher standard. And the bar party has been saying recently that we're focused on racial justice, we're focused on racial equity, and yet we're going to. Uh, uh, try to nominate and confirm Ron, Ron Emanuel to be uh, the next ambassador to Japan. It's unacceptable. And in that clip you showed earlier, you know, he tried to uh, dissolve himself from responsibility and talking about Chicago as a big city and the disconnect between police practice and the mayor's uh, chair. That's, un that's an unacceptable explanation. The mayor and the police should be working hand in glove to promote public safety and ensure people do not get killed. And if someone gets killed, there needs to be accountability, not the passing the buck and not taking take responsibility. When you're the mayor of Chicago, it's unacceptable and we have Fair to enough. do better. F Fair enough, and you, you've, you've made your voice heard on that. I'm interested where we are in this spending bill because depending on who you listen to, uh, it is either hanging by a thread, uh, the social safety net that the president wants, or uh, moderates and President Biden are really close to a deal. Where, where are you in this? We are closer to a deal. We've been negotiating uh, for several weeks, if not several months, on the Build Back Better Act. The hard infrastructure bill is ready to go. It has bipartisan support. Uh, we will vote on that and pass that as soon as we get on the same page with the Build Back Better Act. Uh, we are not going to leave people of color, women of color, children, and seniors behind this time. We left them behind on the New Deal. We're not going to leave them behind this time. So we are working and negotiating closer to a deal, and uh, it's going to be done soon. So it's not but the conflict. For, forgive me, though. Are you really, are you really, are you that much closer to a deal? I'm, I'm thinking about, you've got Joe Manchin who says uh, no to the most important part of the climate change agenda and build back better. You've got Kristen Sinema who's saying no to certain tax increases that would pay for a lot of the things that progressives are interested in. How is that closer to a deal? Well, we are closer today than we were a week ago. This okay. is what negotiating looks like, and this is what the democratic process looks like. So, you know, while it's being reported as this huge civil war and conflict, this is ex exactly how democracy is supposed to work. Well, uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate you coming on to talk about it. It's, uh, it takes a certain amount of moral courage to stand up to the strong men and the leaders in your party, uh, being that and feeling that heat. And uh, you're honorable to come on and talk about it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So are you going to get your kid vaccinated? Well, you may not have a choice. The new mandate's coming for kids. And a new warning from the FCC. Find out why you don't want to buy your friends or families drones for Christmas. At least they end up as Chinese spies. All right, if you were thinking about buying a drone as a Christmas gift for yourself or a loved one, think twice. At least that loved one become a unwitting Chinese spy. 
A new warning from the FCC says those unmanned flying toys could very easily be used for China to spy on your family or whatever it is that you're flying over. The commission says drones made by DJI, the most popular in the United States, are sending data back to China. FCC Commissioner Brendan Cars sounding the alarm bells on this and joins us now. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, all right, realistically, if I'm given a drone on Christmas, I go out and fly it on Christmas Day, what can the Chinese see? Well, this is really troubling. So you have these DJI drones, and they are collecting vast quantities of information, and not just on the law enforcement critical infrastructure side. To your point on the consumer side, there was two research studies that came out that showed that when you download the app to your smartphone to control your individual DJI drone, that it is potentially pulling vast amounts of data from your phone itself about you. And so that's one potential security problem right there. We've had Pentagon officials talk about how they believe that there's information from these drones that is getting sent back to Beijing. So I think it's really troublesome. And these devices themselves, they collect an amazing amount of sensitive information. They can remotely check people's body temperature, their heart rate. So we're talking about uh, really sensitive data that's at risk here. Yeah, even from something that you buy on Amazon for five or six hundred dollars. Uh, DJI put out this statement. Uh, DJI drones are safe, secure for critical and sensitive operations, systems designed so customers never have to share their photos, videos, or flight logs with anyone, including DJI. The data security architecture that protects this information has been repeatedly validated by U.S. government agencies, as well as respected private cybersecurity analysts. I trust that about as much as I trust a gas station sushi, but I'll let you respond. Well, you got to parse some of the words there. It's always interesting when you go through that. But here's what the evidence is. Back in 2017, a DHS field office issued an intelligence bulletin saying it's likely that information from these drones is going back to Beijing. You have the Department of Defense that has largely, with some exceptions, grounded their fleet of uh, DJI drones. You've got the Department of Interior that's taken the same step. And you've got the Commerce Department that put DJI on their entity list based on potential human rights violations where DJI has been coordinating with the national security apparatus in communist China with respect to the repression of Uyghurs. So there is enough data out there to lead all of us, I think, to be very, very concerned. If there's mitigating evidence, I'm happy to see it. But the evidence thus far tells me we should immediately start the process of putting them on the FCC's covered list, which in the interim would mean there wouldn't be federal dollars potentially for these drones. But also in the long term, we're looking at taking our covered list and prohibiting those devices from operating in the U.S. altogether. In fact, Congress just today, the House, passed a bill that would give the FCC authority to do exactly that, that mm. if there are anything on our covered list, they can no longer operate in the U.S. So this is very serious, uh, this path that we're heading down, but I think it's appropriate. You know, you think about it, DJI owns 80% of the U.S. market for drones, uh, 865,000 registered drones in the United States, half a million of those are recreational. Uh, do we assume that anything made by a Chinese co company should be suspect and potentially could be used by Beijing until proven otherwise? Well, the fact that an entity is from or based in China so far has not been enough at the FCC to persuade us to take action. We always look for plus factors. So with Huawei, for instance, we saw certain features of the way their gear was operating. China Mobile wanted to attach to the U.S. network. China Telecom, we took action against. It's never just been because they're from China. We look for additional factors, including close ties to the communist regime. But look, it's troubling. There's a national intelligence law in China that compels any entity to work uh, with their security apparatus on espionage activities. They don't have a choice in those circumstances. So yes, if you're based in China, it's troubling, but it's not enough for us to take action. With DJI, again, there's all these indicia of concerns, and we don't need a Huawei on wings. Yeah, you know, Huawei, obviously, uh, thanks actually in large part to you speaking out about it, uh, was prevented from doing so much uh, in America. I only got about 30 seconds or so, but what makes it different, for example, of an Apple iPhone that's made in China by Foxconn, which is also a Chinese company? Or should we not be suspect of, of that because it's Apple? 
Well, I'm concerned about all of that, principally on the human rights side. I don't think that we should be subsidizing communist China's use of slave labor with our supply chain. But what's different here is the collection of mass sums of data uh, by this entity that there's some indication could be going back to Beijing. That's a real cause for concern here. Yeah, especially considering how much pictures and data and everything else is captured by uh, these drones. Great to see you, sir. Thank you, as always. Good to be with you again. Thanks. Good morning. On balance on Colbert, why the late night funny man deemed our show worthy. My mom liked the clip at least. The Democratic candidate for governor visibly frustrated during a TV interview. Why Terry McAuliffe is a little frustrated, hot under the collar these days, and why he might have a reason to be when we come back. Over. That's it. That's it. Hey, I gave you extra time. Come on, man. You should have asked better questions early on. Hmm. Should have asked better questions. The candidate for the governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, said he appeared to cut an interview short, telling the reporter, as you just heard, to ask better questions. McAuliffe has reasons to be frustrated these days. What was supposed to be an election he could win by a couple of touchdowns is now a dead heat. And this election is a couple of weeks away, less than that. A brand new Monmouth poll shows McAuliffe now dead even with Republican candidate Glenn Youngkin, each 46% of the vote, two weeks to go until election day, a little bit less than that. So it is now well within the margin of error. Kristen Soltis Anderson, friend of the show, columnist at the Washington Examiner and exalted pollster joins us. All right, uh, this is sort of shocking that this is even close. Now that we're in the margin of error, Youngkin seems to have the momentum. This is a bad place to be in for Terry McAuliffe, isn't it? You do not want to be in Terry McAuliffe's shoes right now when you are in a state that Joe Biden won by 10 points and you have polls coming out showing you even with your Republican opponent, especially when you win the name identification battle by a long shot. Terry McAuliffe is a former governor of the state. He's in some ways kind of running as a sort of incumbent. Uh, and so to be in this position is, is not where you want to be. And I think the biggest sign that, that he knows that he's in trouble is the most recent ad that the McAuliffe campaign has put out is one where he is disavowing an opposition ad that says, he didn't want parents having a, their say in what kids are taught in schools. Now, this is a quote from McAuliffe coming from a statement he made. He's claiming it was taken out of context. But when you are just a week or two or a couple weeks out from Election Day, you don't really want your closing message to be, my opponent is misrepresenting my words. I promise I didn't really mean that I don't want parents to have a say in their mm. kids' education. Yeah, it seems like a difficult place to be. And schools have sort of become the key issue here. Call 4-3, Mammoth polling, Glenn Youngkin now leading 39-38 when it comes to who you trust more on leading the schools. Back in August, McAuliffe was ahead by five points. Why the switch? There are a couple of different issues that are embedded within the broader question of schools. One is school safety. Youngkin has been very much on the train of we need to get school resource officers back in schools in places where following the, the killing of George Floyd and, and the Black Lives Matter protests last summer, some schools in more progressive areas said we don't want police officers on our campuses. Um, they're pushing back against that. There have been some allegations in one county in Northern Virginia in particular around sexual assault of student, a student that was seemed to have been covered up in some way, um, or, or perhaps the, the father of the, the child who was assaulted was unhappy with it. That's become a really big issue here in Virginia, and Youngkin has hit on that, as well as questions about the curriculum and standards. You know, are they lowering standards in Virginia schools because it hurts some kids' feelings if they're not in advanced classes? There's also a lot of talk about critical race theory and how are schools handling race. Youngkin has hit on all of those messages. Some of the issues you brought up are local issues. Some of them are national issues. And then we look at the national polling. This is Joe Biden now with a 37% job approval rating, 52% disapproved. This is Quinnipiac, so a different poll, but still very reliable. Uh, this was a Biden plus 10 state. How much do we look at Terry McAuliffe's fortunes or disfortune tied to Joe Biden's poll numbers. There are two ways the national environment affects Virginia. One is because it's a state that voted for Biden by 10, the political fortunes of Biden are very much tied to whether uh, McAuliffe will get that 10 point bump or advantage. Um, if you have a lot of 
that those voters who cast a ballot for Biden now sort of wavering, less enthusiastic, questioning their decision, that's not a place McAuliffe wants them to be. The other thing is that Virginia, not every time, but often goes the opposite direction of the prior presidential election. So structurally, because Biden is the president, it would make it in some ways easier for the challenger to make the case hey, we need a change. That's exactly the message Youngkin's been making. Yeah, fantastic analysis. It happened in 2009 after President Obama won uh, the presidency. You got to also think that so much of the vote for Biden in Virginia was an anti-Trump vote. Uh, you and I both have the privilege of knowing a lot of Virginians who felt that way. So, Kristen, thank you very much. Great conversation as always. Uh, because thank the you. Virginia race is so important, On Balance is going to cover it on the road the Virginia gubernatorial race. We're going to be live from Virginia on Monday, November 1st, and on Tuesday, as the results come in, live from our nation's capital, obviously 7 Eastern, 6 Central. We will see you there. Together, we're completing the operational planning to ensure vaccinations for kids ages 5 through 11 are available, easy, and convenient. Okay. White House plans to roll out Pfizer vaccine for children, COVID vaccines for children as young as five, once the regulators authorize it, as usual, Pfizer's vaccine is at the front of the line, first to approval overall, now first to submit data for kids. And it comes as one watchdog group says Pfizer is putting profits ahead of public health. Public Citizen obtaining some of Pfizer's, quote, secret vaccine contracts with governments, detailed in the Washington Post, alleging Pfizer blocked donations of its own doses and included terms that gave them power over governments to silence them, Pfizer disputes these claims. Joining us now, a member of that consumer group, Zane Risby, law and policy researcher for Public Citizen. Uh, Zane, appreciate it. So is your issue that Pfizer's making money or you think they're making too much money? It's not that, it's about access. We can afford to pay Pfizer, of course, but the problem is that Pfizer has too much power and that power is because of government granted monopolies. The US government and other governments have basically um, allowed Pfizer to run around the world um, uh, demanding these outrageous contractual terms. And that in turn has significantly prohibited access for millions of people around the world uh, to, to, to uh, uh, vaccines quickly. I guess this question though is, doesn't every business keep their contracts private? Doesn't every business have a, a contractual and a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to do best by the business, Pfizer spent billions of dollars on spec to develop this vaccine. Don't they have a right to protect it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in one sense about Pfizer, but the real story is about what governments have, have created and sanctioned right now, because we are living in a situation in which the South African government calls vaccine apartheid. And so you have manufacturers around the world who are trying to make more vaccines and companies like Pfizer are not helping them. Right. In well, a but hold on. So you want you want Pfizer to just to give up their formula? They spend all this money on research and development and just give it away to the South Africans? It's not about giving it up. It's about sharing the vaccine recipe. They can be compensated. They can be, uh, you know, they can make money. The problem is not making money. The problem is the monopoly. Because right now we are living. But, but, in hold on, Zane. Isn't Zane? Isn't that how it works though? If you create a product, the incentive to create a product is that you get a a monopoly over it. If I take if I take that away, what's the incentive for the next pa in the next pandemic for a drug company to do all this research? Look, that's a tired argument that folks put out. But let me put it this way. Pfizer is going to make $30 billion this year alone from the COVID-19 vaccine. This is going to be the most successful product in pharmaceutical history um, on a yearly basis. So the idea that if Pfizer were to suddenly make a few dollars less that it wouldn't create a vaccine for the next pandemic is simply outrageous, right? They are making billions and billions of dollars. What we're saying is we can pay you billions, but at the same time, we can ensure that everyone around the world also gets access. Yeah, Pfizer disputes a lot of this. This is their response to the Washington Post that we've confirmed. Uh, their allegations, they say your allegations have been refuted time and time again by credible sources. They say they've delivered 1.8 billion vaccines to 146 countries uh, in territories. Uh, you know, by the way, Coke doesn't go ahead. You can't demand Coke's formula. Why should you be able to demand Pfizer's? One way of thinking about this is that you don't need Coke's formula to end a pandemic. And so if there is a virus that is spreading all around the world, um, it's not only dangerous to folks outside. It's also uh, dangerous for people in the U.S. for the pandemic to continue unabated. 
And so this is an emergency. This is a once in a century public health crisis. So on mm -hmm. what justification can Pfizer keep the knowledge uh, that is required to end the p pandemic secret? Yeah, I, I think uh, we I think we can go round and round in this argument. We're just going to see it differently. But I appreciate you coming on to talk about it, uh, Zane. Good, good conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, an honorable one, too. A college professor's speech was canceled at MIT amid pressure from campus activists. But is that what academic freedom is really about? A professor who knows way too much about being canceled when we come back. Welcome back. Dr. Dorian Abbott, an associate geophysics professor at the University of Chicago, criticized current diversity, equity, and inclusion standards in higher education, saying it treated people as members of groups rather than as an individual. Here's how Professor Abbott describes his views. In the fall of 2020, I started advocating openly for academic freedom and merit-based evaluations, arguing for the importance of treating each person as an individual worthy of dignity and respect. In an academic context, that means giving everyone a fair and equal opportunity when they apply for a position, as well as allowing them to express their opinions openly, even if you disagree with them. Hard to imagine that that is controversial, but it is. He would seem like the perfect person to speak as a guest lecturer at MIT. Such comments, though, appear to be too controversial to even contemplate at that university and at others. Professor Keith Whittington at Princeton University has faced a number of similar discriminations for daring to discuss basic human rights and joins us now. Uh, is it really that controversial in academia, Professor, now to deal and to talk to people about uh, just evaluating people based on who they are individually with fairness to all? Unfortunately, it increasingly is. These uh, issues of diversity and inclusion and racial identity issues are particularly controversial in academia now. There's a lot of resistance uh, to people who uh, want to buck what is the mainstream view in academia. Uh, Professor Abbott um, uh, wants to challenge uh, some of what's uh, taken as orthodoxy on college campuses, despite the fact that the argument he makes um, is one uh, that's held and, and um, uh, maintained uh, by probably a majority of the American people at large. But on a university campus, um, that's unfortunately taken as extremely controversial, so controversial um, that he's being uh, banned from being able to speak on college campuses. Yeah, well, not only so controversial, it's enshrined in the Declaration. It's what America was founded on, was this idea of individual uh, freedom and individual freedoms and being judged by the in, as an individual. Um, this is MIT's statement. We're going to put it up on the screen so we can lead it. We felt with the current distractions, we would not be in a position to hold an effective outreach event. I made the decision at my discretion after consulting with faculty and students uh, in the department. Uh, and knowing that some might mistake it as an affront to academic freedom, a characterization I do not agree with. Uh, well, okay, he may not agree with it, but what else could it be seen as? I don't think it can be seen in, as anything else. Um, so, so partially, MIT wants to argue the specific lecture that Professor Abbott was invited to deliver was part of a public outreach event. Um, and so because he was going to be speaking to a mixed audience of academics and also members of the public, uh, we should think about that differently uh, than if he was just speaking to a group of scholars. Uh, MIT has said so far, at least, that they're willing to invite him back uh, simply to speak to the department itself and some of the faculty members of that department about his research. But I don't think we can draw that kind of bright line. The effort here by activists is precisely to pressure universities uh, to exclude people that they disagree with, who express views on a wide range of topics, and in this kind of context, prevent them from even being able to uh, give converse, give talks about their core academic research, their core scientific scholarship, to an audience that consists of other scholars. Um, that's just disastrous for what it is universities are supposed to do. And for MIT to cave into that kind of pressure in this context doesn't give us much hope for confidence that MIT is going to do any better in other contexts when activists come to try to silence uh, some other scholar on some other issue. It's really terrifying when you think about it, when you start shutting down thought, because universities were the great places to discuss new and radical ideas, whether it's that the earth is round or nuclear weapons or some of the great political movements have, have been born out of university campuses. You think about the education of the founders and how important that was to them in creating America. Why this flip now that universities are shutting down thought rather than promoting different thought. 
It really is a remarkable transformation. As you say, universities ought to be in the business of dealing with controversial ideas. Um, and that sometimes can be hard. That's going to generate some disagreements. It's going to generate some controversies. Um, sometimes there are going to be calls to uh, suppress that debate. What's really striking is how many of those calls are now coming from inside the house itself. Wow. Um, it's members of the campus community that are insisting that controversial ideas uh, be silenced. Um, and often it's students and administrators and younger members of the faculty um, who are particularly intensely committed uh, mm -hmm. to trying to shut down ideas and disagreements. Um, I think in part it's simply driven by the fact that they see themselves as having a majority position on college campuses yeah. um, and they want to suppress dissent. They don't want people yeah, who disagree I've with them to be able to speak up. I felt it a little bit when I was a student, uh, and I can only imagine what it's like now. Professor, your, your students are lucky to have somebody with the moral courage that you do. I appreciate you being with us and sharing some of it. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Our loyal viewers might have had a case of deja vu watching The Late Show with Stephen Colbert Monday night. And if you missed it, perhaps you were already asleep. Here's a clip. The empty shelves crisis may soon be turning into an empty bottle crisis. Wine bottles, that is, because the supply chain issue is affecting the wine industry. So having difficulty getting the glass needed to bottle their wine. At Franzia, we understand the crisis the wine industry is going through. So we would just like to say, <laughs> suck it, suck it through our plastic spigot. Well, you never ask the chef how the cooking is at times like this. You need a real media expert, a critic, a man with impeccable judgment, decades of experience. Who else other than Dan Abrams fits that bill? All right. I mean, Dan, I got to ask just to gloat a little bit. Have you ever been the lead of Colbert? I have never been the, I've been on Colbert. I've been a guest on oh, Colbert, okay. but right. I've never been, the, but I've never been the lead on Colbert. So, so no, the answer is no. It's kind of crazy. You're you're in the wine business. Uh, did he have a point? Um, you know, look, I have heard. It's funny. I've heard from people at my vineyard that there are problems with getting uh, bottles. I didn't realize it was this bad. Um, and apparently, it is. Now we're not going to be boxing wine at my vineyard. By the way, there are some very good box wines out there. I mean, box wines get a bad rap somewhat deservedly, but there are serious, I shouldn't say serious, there are good boxed wines out there. That's mm -hmm. not what we're making it at my vineyard. And, um, you know, I, I think that I got to start taking this a little more seriously. All right, well, well, sometime perhaps you and I will share some boxed wine, but uh, in the meantime, yeah. let, us, let us know uh, what's on the show tonight. You know, uh, in addition to the, uh, the big developments in the Gabby Petito case and uh, the remains that I think are, are clearly going to be identified as Brian Laundrie, we're going to be leading with that, talking about that uh, during the show. Uh, we're also going to, later in the show, talk about this incident that happened in, in uh, this train in Philadelphia where this woman was raped, and everyone has been focusing on the fact that there were all these bystanders there and no one did anything. Important point. But very few people are talking about the fact that this is someone who was here in the country illegally, but not just illegally, someone who had previously served four months for a sex crime. Wow. Um, and the, the question is, of course, how was he still in the country if they knew he was here illegally? He had served time. He had a long rap sheet. So these are real questions yeah, about the legal system. And you don't have to either be sort of Fox News or CNN and MSNBC on one side or the other to just want to have a rational discussion about how the heck does this happen? Well, how, is it, how the heck does it happen? More importantly, perhaps, how the heck uh, do you keep it from happening in the, in the future? How Correct. many people like him are still uh, wandering around? Because he's probably not the only one. Dan, great conversation. Thank you. We'll stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Those comments have people trying once again to cancel comedian Dave Chappelle. Today, hundreds of Netflix employees and supporters stage a walkout in protest of the streaming service, keeping the comedy special up and available. Protesters are calling for Netflix to take down the special, appoint a trans person to the Netflix board, and give them a pay raise as well. I'm joined now by civil rights attorney Robert Patillo. All right, Robert, uh, where are we on this? 
Uh, well, the place that we're at is the Netflix CEO now uh, taking a step back and saying that he apologizes uh, for his initial stance on the Chappelle comedy special. But I, I do want to reiterate what being people have pointed out, that this is exactly what Dave Chappelle said in his comedy special being proven true. If you talk to real trans advocates and people in the community, they will talk about the 44 trans women that were killed in 2020, a 10 year high. Uh, over a fifth of those people were killed in their own homes, often by intimate partner violence. So the problems that the rank and file trans community have uh, are not being articulated by these problems that the wealthy trans community tries to make problems, Dave Chappelle being the latest one of them. The, the point is that wealthy white men who are later on transition in life um, feel that they have to curtail speech of anybody that may criticize that when the real issues of, of trans people, such as homelessness, with the lack of job opportunities, are not being addressed because they are dominating the com conversation, trying to get comedians put off of uh, streaming services. How much of this outrage is simply because people want something to be outraged about? Because there's a difference, and you would know this as an attorney, there's a difference between offensive speech, which we may not like and can decide to cancel our subscription to Netflix for, and hate speech, which must be stopped, right? something that incites violence, that, that thing. Is, where is the line here and where should the protest be? Uh, well, I think we're seeing what the, li the line is, where you have certain groups that are moneyed and well-connected who decide to make an issue out of everything despite not having rank and file and uh, community support. If you go to any uh, trans community meeting, you know, Black Trans Men of Atlanta, uh, other organizations that work with the homeless trans youth, they're not worried about Dave Chappelle. It's a very small group of money, special interests that feel that they should be able to dictate speech to everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, this is exactly the point that Dave Chappelle was making during the special. Uh, uh, it, know, the people who have virgin ears maybe should not listen to it. But for the remainder of us, he was making the point that there are certain people who have money, have power, have access, who want to dictate to the rest of us what we're allowed to hear yeah. and see and do. And this clearly does not cross that line into hate speech. Yeah, well, you made a very good point. There's very small groups that want to dictate what the rest of us can see, hear, and do. We're seeing it on university campuses, even seeing it on Netflix and comedy specials. Robert, great perspective. Thank you. Thanks. Anytime. Dan Abrams, latest on the Gabba Petito case on the deck.